You're listening to the second season of Breakdown, an exclusive podcast by the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. This season, death in a hot car, mistake or murder. Go to ajcbreakdown.com for additional background, photos, video, and more on the Justin Ross Harris case. Previously on Breakdown. Malice. There's nothing more malicious than what was done to this child's body, baking that car for seven hours. Ross's sex life, no matter how perverse and nasty and wrong that we think it is, it doesn't have a thing in the world to do with the fact that he forgot that little boy. Nothing. Pale yellow. His eyes are fogged up. You see the blood in his blood veins. His tongue was sticking out, blood was coming down where he was gritting. His hands were clenched, straight up, dead. When I left you, Hurricane Matthew was bearing down on the Golden Isles. Georgia's governor had ordered mandatory evacuations. The trial was delayed. Its 16 jurors had scattered to the winds. Matthew did a good bit of damage here, downing trees and damaging homes. There was flooding. There were power outages, but it could have been much worse. The hurricane stayed far enough offshore not to cause widespread devastation along the Georgia coast. So we still have a courthouse. We still have a trial. I'm Bill Rankin, legal affairs writer for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. When I arrived back here in Brunswick, there was no doubt a major storm had hit. Streets were covered with debris. Spanish moss that once clung to the giant live oaks seemed to be everywhere and there was the ubiquitous sound of roaring, buzzing chainsaws as crews cleared roadways and cleaned up yards. By Monday, Judge Mary Staley Clark wanted to know if she'd lost any of the jurors on the Justin Ross Harris murder trial. So she scheduled a hearing for Tuesday, directing court personnel to find those jurors and have them show up the next morning. I believe we're settled. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Staley Clark had called for the hearing to begin at 9. She finally took the bench around 10.45. Apparently, the reason for the delay was to give court officials more time to track down all the jurors. Twelve actually showed up at the courthouse. One woman who had evacuated to Macon had let the court know where she was, but three were missing. By the time Staley Clark took the bench, thanks to help from the sheriff's office, the final three were accounted for. So. Staley Clark quickly adjourned the hearing and announced the trial would start up again the next day. Coordinate and work together uh, to make it as seamless as possible with the awareness that we've just come through a major event. I'm glad all of y'all made it through (laughs) what's been going on and uh, what's been an interesting experience. And we are in recess until 9, and the press made it too. Look at y'all. Good to see y'all too. We're in recess until court 9 in the morning. When the trial finally resumed on Wednesday, much of the focus was on little Cooper Harris. Prosecutors played a security video from inside the Chick-fil-A, where Harris took Cooper shortly before he left him in the hot car that day. It showed Harris carrying Cooper on his hip, walk up to the front counter and order breakfast. Grinning, Harris shook hands with Chris Redman, the store's general manager. Here's Redman recalling his brief greeting with Harris and his son shortly before Cooper ate his last meal. My interaction started, I was bringing ice to the front counter in the drive-thru, and I saw um, Mr. Harris and Cooper at the front counter, and I just said, hey, good morning, guys. And I said, who's this little guy? And uh, it was Cooper, so I waved to Cooper, and I said, hey, Coop. Prosecutors also called upon Cooper's daycare teachers, who let the jury know a lot more about that little boy. Here's a sampling of testimony from Melanie Gibson, Azure Hawkins, Michelle Gray, and Kiata Patrick. They all worked with Cooper at the Little Apron Academy. Cooper was an affable child. He was a talker, calm nature, um, very easy to get along. Um, just, just a normal, soon to be two year old. He was active, an active toddler, talking and playing with his friends. He was very active. He had learned how to say my name which I thought was adorable. Cooper was a fun-loving child. I was able to see his growth from not walking and crawling on the floor to 
walking. He started talking actually mm -hmm. more in late mm -hmm. May and so the early part of June. I was very excited because he was talking, he was able to tell us, you know, he wanted more. We was able to have more conversations, interactive conversations. And actually the day before that day, when he woke up from nap, he looked at me and he said, I need a diaper. And I was so excited because I'm like, okay, you're using words, you know, you're making sentences. Okay, that was the before. Prosecutors also made sure to show jurors the after through four witnesses. Two police officers, a paramedic, and a crime scene technician, prosecutors got them to describe what they saw when they came upon Cooper lying on the hot pavement at the Acres Mill Square parking lot. This meant prosecutors got to repeatedly display to the jury the horrid photos of Cooper's lifeless body, and some jurors struggled to keep their eyes on the pictures. Atlanta criminal defense attorney Esther Panich, who was in court last week watching the proceedings, explains why the prosecution made it a point to show the jury both the before and after of Cooper's life. The state wants to humanize and make this really about a dead little boy, uh, someone who died in the worst possible circumstances. Because Cooper can't be here for himself, the state is acting as his voice. So to tell the jurors who he was, and the jury's entitled to know he was a fun, cute little boy who was behaving like little boys do. He was learning how to pronounce names of his teachers. He was, uh, he would dress up in costume. And he was a full participant in his daycare and in life. And it was snuffed out by something that is either unbelievably cruel and heartless or incredibly reckless. So it's, it's to humanize him. As to the repeated viewing of the photos? They do that to show how horrific the death was. And if you do believe that Ross Harris meant to kill his son, then it shows how depraved he must have been. Uh, or how reckless he must have been, because what you see is this baby clawing at himself, and, and he's got abrasions on the back of his head. And it's really just a, a, a horrible, horrific, there's no words to describe the death of a child in that manner. It's interesting because the judge will instruct the jurors that sympathy nor prejudice should factor in it all in their deliberations. But how does one not be sympathetic when you're dealing with the death of a child? So it will be that much harder for jurors to put that, those images aside and to say, yes, he's guilty or no, he's not guilty, despite the ugliness of the death. Prosecutors also used the daycare worker's testimony to show jurors Harris had deviated from his routine in the weeks leading up to and the day of Cooper's death. Kiata Patrick, one of Cooper's teachers, testified Harris took a picture of his son every morning he dropped him off at daycare. But two weeks before Cooper died, she noticed Harris had stopped doing that. She asked him why. Harris told her Cooper was getting too old for that. Teachers also testified that Harris typically dropped Cooper off between 8.30 and 8.45, and when he was running late, he'd usually call to let them know, sometimes to ask them to save breakfast for Cooper. On the morning of Cooper's death, Harris left the Chick-fil-A at 8.55, according to surveillance video. This day, he didn't call to say he was running late, teachers said. Maddox Kilgore, one of Harris's lawyers, got the teachers to acknowledge that Harris loved his little boy. They said he was an active participant in his son's life. On at least one occasion, Harris showed up at daycare wearing a Home Depot mascot costume. Kilgore showed photos of that to the teachers, reminding them of the day when Harris dressed up as the Home Depot drill. I know, I know, I know what you must be thinking. A drill? Really? But let's just stay out of the hardware department for now, okay? The questioning of Little Apron teacher Azure Hawkins showed how much prosecutors are trying to paint one picture of Harris while the defense is trying to paint quite another. Here are Kilgore and prosecutor Chuck Boring taking turns to make their points. Ross was a, uh, he was a very um, engaged parent, very engaged dad with Cooper, wasn't he? Yes. There would be occasions when he, he would actually come back to, to Little Aprons during the day just to check on Cooper and hang out. 
Yes. And when he brought him in in the morning, um, Ross wasn't the kind of dad that would just drop and run. He got him settled, sometimes actually sat down on the floor and played with him, didn't he? Right. Parents don't come in um, and tell you their intimate personal business, do they? No. Um, is if Ross was being unfaithful to his wife, you wouldn't expect him to come in and unload that on you, would you? I should hope not. No. no. Just briefly, based on one of the issues across, I know uh, defense counsel asked you about uh, whether families discuss their sex life and things like that, right? Right. If you heard or knew that he was sexting other women and going to prostitutes and things like that, would that be night and day from the way he portrayed himself to you? Right. How he portrayed himself to you was, in fact, what you saw over the period of more than a year with Cooper, which was you knew he loved that little boy. Isn't that true? Yes. Boring shot back up out of his seat. He asked one final question that surely resonated with the jury. Did he also act like he loved his wife? Yes. So I have Then there's the smell of death. As expected, the prosecution called on police officers who testified they smelled an odor that they associated with death inside Harris's SUV. You'll remember we went over all this way back in episode two. At the probable cause hearing, little more than two weeks after Cooper's death, lead detective Phil Stoddard made the first mention of an odor. Now, did you actually access that vehicle later as well? I did. And you went inside that vehicle hours later. Did you notice anything? Yeah, it, it smelled like it was a foul order. Um, it smelled like decomposition or death. A quick recap. Seven hours after leaving Cooper in his car, Harris left work at 4.15 that afternoon to go see a 5 o'clock movie. He got into his car with the body of Cooper inside and drove two miles. He said he didn't realize his son was in the car until he was making a lane change. He looked back to make sure the way was clear and saw his little boy. At least, that's been Harris's story. So he screeched to a halt in the Acres Mill Square parking lot. Prosecutors could make the very compelling argument. If there was a stench in the car, why didn't Harris notice it when he first got in? Their implication? He did notice it when he first got in, but he already knew his son was dead. He chose not to notice Cooper until a couple of miles down the road. This point is central to the prosecution's case. Harris would have noticed the, quote, odor of death immediately, but he ignored it because he knew what it was, knew his son was dead, and was trying to add another dimension to his story that it had all been an accident. That is an incredibly depraved calculation. If jurors can be convinced that Harris was thinking this way, then they will believe Harris was capable of anything, including the premeditated, torturous murder of a little boy. In other words, this could be a really, really big deal. The first witness to say he noticed a smell associated with death was crime scene technician Brad Shumpert. He described smelling a hot, musty, urine-soaked diaper odor. Next, Captain James Farrell testified about the smell. And I, so I stuck my head into the edge of the door and I smelled the interior of the car and noticed that there was an odor inside the vehicle. Okay. And could you describe the, the, the smell or what, what you smell when you put your head inside the car? Um, it was a combination of odors and uh, it was really, you could smell the odor of a diaper uh, from a child and also from having a couple of kids. Um, you could smell the sweat of a child in there. So it smelled like the sweat and the diaper and then also really had that really mm -hmm. unusual odor that I can only associate is, is with something that's dead. Later, when cross-examined by Brian Lumpkin, one of Harris's attorneys, Farrell described it again. Uh, it was several things. It was a combination of smells. It smelled like sweat. It smelled like a diaper, because diapers smell like diapers. Um, and, and then it smelled like the, the odor of, of death. Farrell also noted that he didn't make note of the smell in a written report until a year after Cooper's death. Quite honestly, it was an oversight on my part at that point. It should have been done. But let me note that Detective Stoddard, when he testified at that probable cause hearing two years ago, said Farrell had told him he smelled an odor of death inside the car, too. Then there was crime scene investigator Kerry Grimstead. He also testified he smelled an odor associated with death. Grimstead said he noticed it when he processed Harris's SUV in the police crime shed the night of Cooper's death. It's a smell that I associate with a lot of death scenes, so yes, it's... 
one of those things that comes with the scene. It's hard to explain the smell, and it's, once you've smelled it, it's uh, very, you smell it, you know what it is. A lot of times it's a sweaty, musty kind of smell. Like I said, it's very difficult to explain that smell to somebody who's never smelled it before. Quite coincidentally, I guess, like Farrell, Grimstead waited a year before making note of the odor in a written report, too. He didn't mention it in the highly detailed report he submitted in June 2014. He waited to do so until August 2015 in a supplemental report. Defense attorneys wanted to know why. When asked why he waited so long, Grimstead said the issue came up one day when he and others involved in the case were talking to Detective Stoddard. Defense attorney Lumpkin asked Grimstead for details of that conversation. You said this is typical, something you see all the time, all the scenes you go to, but yet three detectives started talking about it. We were talking about many different things, and that came up. I, I cannot recall exactly who brought up the uh, mention the odor. Grimstead at least remembered the conversation occurred in the Crimes Against Persons office. That's where Stoddard and Farrell worked at the time of Cooper's death. Would it be fair for you to uh, describe this odor as unremarkable? No, that would not be fair because somebody who's never smelled that before, it would be very remarkable. Was it remarkable to you because somebody else brought it to your attention and asked you to write a report to say that? Uh, we were talking about it and it came up and I said, well, yeah, that's correct. If you remember, I interviewed a couple of extremely experienced medical examiners in episode two. Both said it was too early for anyone to detect a quote, smell of death, unquote. That's because decomposition, which causes the smell, doesn't occur until at least 24 hours after someone dies. So, after hearing the officer's testimony last week, I made another phone call to Dr. Joe Burton. He's the former medical examiner for several metro Atlanta counties. He's performed more than 10,000 autopsies and visited hundreds of death scenes. He said he's read recent news reports about the smell of death testimony in the Harris case. He said it made him think of our conversation earlier this year. Less than a week ago in my office, my lead investigator, who's been a homicide detective in Cobb County and an ME investigator for most all his life, 30 years plus for all of that. My autopsy technician has been with me for 24 years and uh, he's assisted with three or 4,000 autopsies going to death scenes and things like that. And uh, we all talked about the fact that it's summertime, we can go out there in their par my parking lot and open up a dozen cars that might be out there and we can smell an odor just from the heat that's generated from the carpet, the upholstery and things. Cooper might not have been dead for just a few hours before he was discovered, Burton said. To say that there was an odor of, you could detect that was indicative of something dead isn't consistent with what happens in the real world or facts. I'm not disputing the fact that these officers claim they can smell, can smell an odor, uh, although it's a little strange that they didn't make a note of it till a year later. But uh, there's no way that I or anybody that I know in the business legitimately would say that there's a reasonable scientific probability that you would open that door and smell an odor that you could say was a dead child or a dead body or something like that. There's one more thing that should be noted about Farrell's testimony. When he got to the scene, he was in charge, and he told Shumpert, the crime scene tech, to treat the scene like it was a homicide. When asked why, here's what Farrell said. If you lock a child inside a car and the child dies, then it's a criminal case. And uh, so there was no doubt in my mind it was a criminal case. It was just what circumstances surrounded that to what level of a criminal case it was going to take it to. But it was a criminal case for certain in my mind when we got there. This indicates that Cobb police had made up their minds it was a criminal case while Cooper's body still lay on that hot pavement before they'd interviewed any witnesses. And police formally charged Terrace with murder later that night, just six hours after they arrived at the scene. The trial wound down Friday with dry testimony of how police searched Harris's computers and cell phone. But just before court recessed, the prosecution ended the week literally with a bang. They called a former prostitute who said she'd had sex with Harris three times just a few weeks before Cooper's death. 
Daniela Dorr said she became involved in the case when she was caught in a sting by an undercover cop police officer in September 2014. But the cop told Dorr, who was already on probation and had pot in the motel room, he didn't want to arrest her. Instead, he wanted to see if she could identify Harris as one of her former clients. Dorr said that was an easy decision. Being on probation and knowing the situation I had myself in, the best bet for me was to be cooperative. So they showed her Harris's booking photo. I was very confident that I recognized him. I was at least 90% sure. Dorr said it was easier for her to remember Harris because he was a repeat customer. Also, because she preferred African-American clients, Harris stood out because he's a white guy. Also, this. The way I was able to describe him was just, he didn't have any presence about himself. Like he just didn't care. Very dumpy, just, you know, a little bit overweight, a little bit on the hefty side. You know, he just really didn't care about his appearance. As for the sex? There was never any nervousness. It was always like he was very relaxed. Nothing was ever going on. He really didn't talk about much. It was more or less strictly business and then go along your way. It was basically regular vanilla sex, you know, no crazy fetishes, no nothing. Dora also explained how she conducted her business. I'm not your psychiatrist. I'm not your therapist. You came to see me normally because your wife wouldn't shut up. I didn't want to know about your kids. I didn't want to know about nothing. You came in, you got your pleasures, your jollies, and you went about your way. Next on Breakdown. The prosecution is likely to continue presenting evidence of Harris's sexual promiscuity. As soon as I saw the picture and it was like, yeah, I had seen him a couple of times, that's when the broad scheme of what exactly what was going on had came to play. Season two of Breakdown, Death in a Hot Car, Mistake or Murder, is a production of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. The story is reported and told by Bill Rankin, produced by Richard Hallix. Audio production by Chris Basta of Bare Knuckles Creative. The music for Breakdown was composed and performed by Bo Emerson, Chris Nicholson, and Chris Basta. Special thanks to Burt Roten, Ross Cavett, Chris Nicholson, and Buddy Hall.